In this video, I'll show you how a lens works. A lens is a piece of typically glass, curved surface like part of a sphere, and the lens works by refraction. So by application of Snell's law at the interface between air and glass. And you know, you have positive lenses that can magnify images. You also have negative lenses that demagnify. And in this lecture, I'll start by showing the math behind the action of a lens at a single surface, so from air to glass, we'll encounter the problem of spherical aberration that we'll quickly discard, and then we go to a real lens with two surfaces and show how you can use that, how you can describe that with the lens maker's equation. We consider the lens action through refraction on a curved surface between two media, typically glass and air. And the refraction in this problem depends only on the ratio between these two indices. So let's consider first a parallel incident beam that is focused at the distance S2, which is thus equal to the focal length. And this focusing occurs because of refraction at this surface. If you look at the wave fronts, flat wave fronts here, curved wave fronts here, and like I said, things are focused here. So the challenge is to calculate this distance for this geometry. So let's consider one specific ray hitting the surface at the distance h away from the optical axis. In this figure, I've added a couple of uh, expressions, like angles and things like that, to help us calculate this distance s2. Uh, so we use geometry, geometric arguments, and one of the things we can calculate is, for instance, the relation h is r times the sine theta 1. Theta 1 is here. If you look at this triangle, you see this relation. Uh, you can also look at a different triangle, like this triangle. And if you look at that triangle, you get the relation uh, h is uh, s2 minus delta times the tangent of beta. And the final relation is, of course, the application of Snell's law at this interface. If you apply Snell's law, you have n1 sine theta 1 is n2 sine theta 2. Now, these expressions, expressions look complicated, but you can play a trick in the so-called paraxial limit. And the paraxial limit applies when all angles are much smaller than one. And in that limit, you can use sine theta is approximately theta, tangent theta is approximately theta. And so if you apply that limit to these expressions, you find here r times theta 1. For this guy, you find uh, s2 uh, times beta is approximately s2 times theta 1 minus theta 2, where you used delta much smaller than s2. And finally, for this expression, you use n2 sine theta. So let's clean this up. Now these are the, the equations we just derived, in particular in the paraxial limit, small angles, where uh, you also use this expression, approximately theta 2. If you combine them and do a little bit of math, you find this end result. And there are two things to notice. First of all, this expression depends only on the ratio between the refractive indices, as expected. And second, this expression is independent of the height h of the ray hitting the surface. So all rays at all different heights cross the optical axis at the same point. You focus the light. To derive the previous result, we use the paraxial approximation. Uh, which approximates all angles to be small. 
and it approximates the sine theta, which in the Taylor expansion looks like this, simply by theta, it approximates the cosine theta uh, by one, and the tangent theta also by theta. And if you wonder what happens if you go to larger angles theta, you'll notice if you apply Snell's law that these larger angles, they refract in a slightly different way and the intercept with the optical axis moves uh, towards the interface. So the focal length actually depends on angle in this way. And if you wonder how big this effect is, you could look at the Taylor expansion of the sine theta, which looks like this. And this additional factor is what causes the aberrations. So if you want the aberrations, for instance, to be smaller than 1%, you notice that this angle should be smaller than the square root of 0 0.06, which is 0 0.24 rad, or 14 degrees. So you call this spherical aberration, and uh, it's an excursion in this lecture because we typically assume small angles and will, for now, forget about this effect. Previously, we considered the refraction of a parallel beam of light on a curved spherical surface. Now we consider the more general case of imaging through this curved surface where you have a point source which is emitted into the other medium. Now to solve this, we again use the paraxial limit. So all angles small. And if you look at the picture, you see there are three angles involved. Uh, for instance, theta one angle in this triangle. And in the paraxial limit, uh, you can easily express this thing as approximately h of s2. Another angle is this angle theta two in this triangle, which you can also express as a ratio between h and s2, because distance is, is very small in the paraxial limit. Finally, we have the angle alpha, this angle in this triangle, and that is h over r. And then as a centerpiece, everything works through refraction. Uh, application of Snell's law at this interface, if you look at the angles involved, you see that this angle is alpha plus phi one, and this angle is alpha minus phi one, phi two. And so if you apply Snell's law, and one sine theta one is n two, uh, sorry, and one times sine alpha plus theta one is n two times sine alpha minus theta two. And if you use the paraxial limit again, you find this form and then if you plug in the angles you have here, you find n1 times h over r plus h over s1 is n2 times h over r minus h over s2. And if you combine them, you find the centerpiece of this lecture, the expression n1 divided by s1 plus n2 divided by s2 is n2 minus n1 over r. That's an equation that I would like you to remember, because this is really important. This slide summarizes the previous derivation, which was based on the application of the perpetual limit to some geometric uh, expressions, and yielded a very important expression of this form, which I said, please remember this expression. And in this slide, I only want to discuss two limits, for instance, the limit as one goes to infinity, which is the case that we started with of a parallel beam. And if you plug this into the equation, you find S, the expression S2 is N2 over N2 minus N1 multiplied by R or R divided by this. And I write it in this way to show you again that only the ratio between the refractive indices matters. And if you take the limit of N2 over N1 to infinity, then this R S2 is approximately R, as you expect, because if you apply Snell's law, 
to a high refractive index medium, you get refraction towards the surface normal, and this focal length is close to the radius of curvature. Uh, if you look at another case, for instance, S2 goes to infinity, where you have parallel rays here, and you start from a focus here, you'll find that uh, a similar expression, but now with n1 in the numerator. So you find that if you take the same limit, uh, this S1 goes to 0. Here you'll see that the focus in the air side is different than the focus in the glass side, basically because of Snell's law. Next, we consider the action of a real lens, which contains two interfaces. One from air to glass, with a curvature in this way, and the other from glass to air. And in this sketch that I have drawn, one curvature is to the right, and we call this a positive R, and the other curvature is to the left, and we call this a negative R. And if you consider this system, you can derive an expression for the focusing by application of the previous expression from air to glass and then from glass to air again, and you find this generic form with the so-called lens makers equation, which tells you how to make a lens of a certain focal length based on the material with refractive index n in air and two uh, radius of curvature. So this expression only works for thin lenses. And like I said, uh, beware of the signs of R1 and R2, positive R1, negative R2, in this situation, uh, if you plug in the numbers in the equations, you might find that this S prime that you calculate is smaller than zero, and that means you have a virtual image, an image not here, but somewhere here. Uh, and finally, uh, you can think about the magnification of the system. How does this lens magnify? And if you then, for instance, draw an arrow here and wonder how it is imaged in the system, the easiest ray to draw is a ray through the center of the lens. And in the center of the lens, uh, the double refraction eventually makes the ray pass straight on, which means that the magnification you have in the system is the ratio between this distance S prime and S with a minus sign because this arrow is pointing down if this arrow is pointing up. We just saw that the action of a lens is based on refraction at interfaces, first from air to glass, then from glass to air. You can also take a different perspective and look at the change in the wave front. So look at what happens to light emitted by all the Huygens sources here. And if you take that perspective, you'll see that the light emitted in the center passes through lots of glass and is thus pretty slow in its travel, whereas light passing through the edges has more air and a smaller amount of glass, so it's faster. So if you then look at what happens to the curvature of the wavefront, it started flat, but at this point it's bent and it produces focusing. And the cute thing is that if you apply the same perspective to a different geometry, like a concave air void in glass, you find that this system also acts as a positive lens, despite its shape, because also here, the rays in the center, they travel slower because they pass through more glass, whereas the ray at the edges, they travel faster because they pass through more air. 
So again, starting with a flat wave front, uh, after passing through this funny shaped lens, you have a concave wave front at the exit and focusing action. And the third system that has the same action is a so-called graded index lens. And a graded index lens is a flat piece of material where the refractive index changes with position in such a way that in the center it's highest, but towards your edges, the refractive index decays in this parabolic shape. And also this system, if you start with flat wave fronts and look at what happens to the rays of light, you'll notice that in the center it's slow, high refractive index, whereas in the edges it's somewhat faster. And a flat wave front is converted into a curved wave front, which is focused to a point. So in all these systems, it's the difference in uh, propagation in the center and the edges, which converts a flat wave front into a curved wave front and produces the focusing. So the claim is that the lens action of all these three systems is the same. They all produce a positive lens action because the optical pass lengths from A to B is larger in the center than at the edges by this form. So all optical paths that you can draw from this plane wave to the focus are all equally long as required by Fermat's principle to make a true focus here. So in this lecture, we derived expressions to show how refraction from a curved surface between medium N1 and N2 can lead to lens action. And for a single surface, we derived one expression, which I'd like you to remember or derive. For a real lens, we had a slightly different expression to account for refraction at two interfaces. And the expression we derived only applies to thin lenses. Again, an expression to remember. Uh, a relation between the distance between the source point and the image point, S and S1, relative to the focal length of the lens, and the so-called lens maker's equations which describes how strong the lens is, what the focal length of the lens is, depending on the curvature of the first interface in this picture positive, the curvature of the second interface in this picture negative, and the ratio between the refractive indices of the lens material and the surrounding. So a general expression which you can also use for instance, if you use a lens underwater, because underwater you basically only change N1, and that's it.